I'm Dr. Bina Fille and you're watching Site Talk at SMC. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to another episode of Site Talk at SMC. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected everyone all over the globe and we are no exception. So we had to change the format of Site Talk from in person to online. But we are not complaining because uh, we are able to connect to many many more great scientists all over the world and today we are joined by a mother, a scientist or should I say a young scientist awardee by INSA by CSIR and 2018 National Bioscience Awardee, none other than Dr. Bina Pillai. Hello ma'am. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good. Okay. Uh, first of all, a very good morning and uh, mm-hmm. thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Could you please start with your education and uh, how from Kerala to Bombay to Delhi, your journey, a little about that. Yeah, I was born in a small town or village in Kerala and I was uh, there for just a few months. I have no memories of that time. And then we moved to Bombay because my parents were in Bombay. Around seven years of age, I started staying with my relatives in Kerala, my uncle and aunt. And most of my uh, conscious terms, when I remember my childhood, that's in their house. And uh, when I finished my 12th standard, I decided to move in with my parents in Bombay. And uh, I did my degree from Bombay. At the end of, uh, so that was in uh, Ruya College, Bombay. And I learned microbiology BSc there. And then I got an opportunity to go to Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and did my integrated PhD. So MSc and PhD from IISC. And uh, when I finished um, from IISC, then uh, I got an opportunity to work in Delhi as a scientist, as a young scientist. So I moved to Delhi. So yeah, this has been mostly my journey. Any student who wants to join your lab or uh, you want to give him or her a demo, like a you know, intro- introduction about your work, what you will say? Uh, so scientifically or? Yes, scientifically. Yes, yeah, scientifically. So I think the, so there was a time in my lab where I was open to many suggestions and trying out many different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, if In fact, uh, if you ask people, generally you would hear that I have worked on many, many different things and not being very focused about it. That's because I started early. And I felt that was an exploratory phase. Over the last three, four years, I have been trying to focus more and more. And now there are three tracks that we are following. So uh, my earliest projects as an independent PI were all on polyglutamine disease. So this is a rare neurodegenerative disorder uh, where because of protein aggregation, neurons die and neurons once dead are difficult to replace. So we have been trying to see that what is it ha- what is happening around those neurons why are they dying why are other neurons around them dying and so on and one surprise finding we have had is that neurons alone so i'm not talking about immune cells now conventional neurons also release interferons when they are exposed to polyglutamine proteins and interferons are conventionally thought to be uh, cell cell communication molecules in the immune field So I would like to see whether this is even potentially important as a therapeutic target. And we have proposed that the interferon release from polyglutamine containing cells is responsible for the cell death that we see in the brain. So that's an angle I'd like to pursue. Mm -hmm. Another very favorite uh, hypothesis that now we have three, four papers that we have proven that in is that non-coding RNAs are inherited in the ooplasm and the sperm. And during fertilization, this is like a, uh, these RNAs are inherited from one generation to the next. And because of that, they can influence the outcome of the zygote without touching the DNA. So non-coding RNA as a form of epigenetic inheritance and a memory that transcends from one generation to the next. This is something that I'm uh, actively pursuing. And the third aspect is something that I have no clue how it's doing it, but I'm very fascinated with it. And that is earthworms and how they regenerate. You have seen the research world because you finished your PhD by 2002 and this is 2020. So you have seen the research world, you can say more than 20 years. So how is India then and how is India today 
in terms of opportunities, scope and facilities for research? Yeah, so I think it has gone from strength to strength. I don't have that data now, but I remember a graph from those times where per capita number of publications um, hmm. on a graph, you know, so US and UK were somewhere right on top, Germany, Switzerland, these were the advanced countries. And India was somewhere very much at the bottom. And, uh, but it was on the trend line. So it was very much like the, compared to the investment, the return was comparable. I think India is, I, I saw a similar graph last year and India is now I think third in that uh, okay. ranking order. And in terms of number of publications, in terms of many other parameters of measuring science, it has steadily risen and that is great. Uh, in my field, in uh, we've started seeing more and more high impact publications also come up. As a student, our dream was to publish perhaps uh, three or four papers at the end of a PhD and be in well-respected journals. Yeah. Now I think we are seeing more and more ambitious work where people are ready to wait for four or five years and maybe even longer and then go for a big publication. That is also a trend that has changed over the years. About research at IZIB, one more question. To enter into IZIB, what is the procedure? How one can enter IZIB as a PhD student? Uh, we have a, a procedure that is currently changing. So what I'm saying may change in a few months. Uh, initially, we had a pretty narrow uh, uh, gate where you had to clear a CSIR NET fellowship or some other valid fellowship, then come for an interview. So we usually have two rounds of interview. Uh, the first one is uh, quite rigorous. The second one is relatively uh, less rigorous. We have less uh, you know, rejection at the second interview stage and uh, then you could choose a lab right away and if you like the lab that you are assigned then you could join. Hmm. Now over the last uh, one or two years we have been relaxing that criteria so uh, I think we've been having more project assistants come in and take an in internal interview after a couple of years we have other criteria they have to have a publication and so on hmm. but many students are also coming through that route. So is there any uh, life lesson that you have learned during a PhD or as a PI that you want to pass on to the next generation of students? Any life lesson? Not research? Many, I think. Many. And, uh, okay. and I think it's difficult to just think of one. Mm. But uh, uh, I think to just trust your heart. The, okay. uh, when I was very young, I was very confident about uh, what I wanted to do and I was sure I wanted to do it in a certain way. With time, I started having some doubt, self-doubt and all that. Mm -hmm. But eventually, I realized that finally, if you have to get something done, you have to believe in your idea, get out there, do it. You will fail a few times, but that's okay. Through the failure, you will learn something and you will come out stronger. As you say, you are doing outreach work uh, at IZIB. What are these outreach work related to? Can you just so, tell us about this more? So when I became a scientist and when I started seeing more of the world, I realized that I wish other students like me right from school days could have seen that this is an option. So my primary criteria is that there is a section of the society which does not even know that such options exist. So first target is to reach them. Second target is I think we all need to see more of science in our daily life. So I would like to open the newspaper and see scientific reports more yeah. than we have so much of misinformation and so many it's other not things. happening though yeah but basically i would say i have been on a flight once and mm -hmm. uh, the person sitting next to me just happened to ask me that uh, you know what does your institute do what do scientists do and all that and i was struggling to explain and then i take the newspaper from the uh, plane uh, you know that jacket there and i open it up and one of my colleagues work was featured in the paper that day okay. and i was like yeah this is what we do <laughs> and uh, and it so that kind of that was the time when I suddenly realized that I I do believe that we need to talk to the society and uh, they need to know that um, the scientific approach to problems is so important. So I also work with NGOs and all also not just school children and college uh, students. What I have personally done is mostly focused on the areas that I know pretty well. So genomics, understanding. I was in Ames visiting a patient. And I heard a conversation between two people there talking to each other. 
and some child who had come with a uh, genetic disease and they were talking to each other and they were saying that buzurgon ka paap hai and and that kind of triggered something in me and i had to do something about it yeah. so i've written a small uh, book called no your genome several years back i'm now revising during the pandemic i found some time to revise okay. and update that but uh, so that's one thing i did then later on continuously we've been having thousands of students visit our institute and i coordinate our phd students to talk to them and i personally also do uh, workshops on now we have been doing it online so this session we have called genomic ki brahman where students can log in with me and explore the genome with me so this weekend we will be um, in, uh, we'll be connecting with about 50 students and they'll be isolating dna in their homes using things around their environment and we will be showing them the corresponding experiment from our lab so how is your support system uh, being a scientist and a mom you have a son how do you balance your life professional and personal life at once yeah i think i am extremely lucky i uh, i i don't think everyone gets such a favorable environment to do both so at home i have a pretty well accomplished uh, very passionate dedicated scientist for a husband and i have a son who is also quite fascinated with science so it is fun at home too um, and sometimes the borders are uh, sort of blurred so uh, for example my son has taught me how to use software that i can use for science communication and so so it's been very fluid for me and very comfortable my mother in law would come and stay with us and help me mm-hmm. in the initial days and one thing i would like to say is that for every beena you say, see in india there are probably so in my case my mother in law's name is geeta there is a, a girl who used to stay with us and take care of my son for 7 years okay. uh, her name is mithu and there are, there are always all these people behind yeah, yeah. so it's not just one beena and uh, yeah it's been it's been very good for me every time i wanted help there was somebody to chip in that is not to say that there haven't been challenges mm. uh, i have also faced those challenges head on and sometimes made some hard choices i don't know whether those choices were right or not but it served well for me so for example starting a lab before starting a family so i delayed yeah. starting a family for a long although so i started my uh, lab at 29 but i had my son at 33 so that this is the i think average age for right now for all the scientist women scientist out there sir yeah but it was a very conscious decision in my case have you found your best phd student yet i've had some very good ones but i certainly hope they were not the best and i keep getting better ones <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so have you ever regretted for not doing a long post doc what gives you more satisfaction patent or publication hmm publication i think yeah but it's a difficult choice i could be happy yeah. with patents too <laughs> <laughs> so if you get a time machine and you can rewind time would you make any change to your life yes i would <laughs> uh probably be uh more tolerant and more accepting of people's individual ambitions when i was younger i had only seen uh, a certain small segment of the world and i assumed that everyone will be like me and should be ambitious and should be driven and but that people can go through patch uh, bad patches in life and they need support is something i learned on the way yeah if i could so, go back uh, some of that i'll do that okay so you mentioned that uh, when you started as a pi you were less tolerant than you are now so how can you explain it a li- little bit so see i as i said before i had a, a very supportive family my parents had always told me you know be ambitious study do well and so on and uh, i assumed that that's what everybody wanted to do and everybody had that kind of a background secondly i had finished my phd and without a postdoc uh, joined here uh, professor brahmachari who was running the institute at that time who was director at that time he had taken a sort of difficult call 
and when i joined i didn't realize it but after i joined i realized that he had placed a lot of trust uh, in my abilities and i felt uh, that i had to so i perhaps overcompensated and worked uh, and was very demanding on my students they all need not have felt the same way and uh, i think i have i was unabashedly unapologetically demanding at that time but then i learned more about my surroundings i learned the backgrounds many of them come from and then i felt that for their journey they've already made a big leap and i felt i needed to be more tolerant and if i gave them more time and uh, a more nurturing environment then they would uh, do better so i think i have become better <laughs> but so how many students have graduated from your lab till now to 11th one just finished this year Okay. there have been couple of collaborative ones i'm not counting yeah, those yeah. Mm -hmm. so whenever a uh, phd student completes his thesis or her thesis do you party or go for a dinner or lunch yeah i love going out with my students and especially for these academic milestones i don't attend that many weddings or birthday parties but i like to celebrate even the smallest uh, achievements and um, phd Uh, finishing a phd is certainly something very special uh, i also like to give them something that's very personal that's uh, i hope they will treasure so i have painted kurtas for uh, wow. students depicting their work and i have uh, sometimes given them books which usually is related to some th some discussion that we had during the uh, phd i have uh, my another student who's finishing this year my gift to her is to teach her driving so sometimes it's not even things it's experiences so yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah, I, i like to make a big deal out of it i think you are an excellent guide i have not seen any guide who has gifted self painted kurtis or taught driving i have not met anyone like that yet this is very cool thanks <laughs> i hope <laughs> you think so though <laughs> let us talk about hobbies do you have any hobbies Yeah, lots. In fact, sometimes uh, to the extent that I'm not a painter. I'm not a painter, but I do some fabric painting, and yeah, I can get a good uh, graphic image out. So I'm trying to now learn digital art also. Oh. So okay. yeah, I I've off late just started doing some embroidery also, and I've always loved to sew my own clothes or others' clothes, and I like I've just picked up gardening, but I've always had pets. so birds and fishes and and now my son shares that hobby with me so it's great fun yeah uh thank you thank you dr pillai it was an honor speaking to you and it was you are really really a very lovely person and a lovely guy that i can say from my side and thank you for joining us today at sci talk i also I totally enjoyed your questions it made me rethink many of my um uh, pit stops and Uh, critical points in my journey so this has been a nice experience for me too thank you <laughs>